it's, it's not going to be aimed at the uh, real experts, but uh, maybe the sort of general member of the program or something like special program or something like that. Uh, <coughs> and we're, I'll, we'll concentrate on, on giving the general idea of what uh, can be proved, where the restrictions that are there come from, uh, and the general lines of the argument rather than trying to give detailed arguments for anything. Uh, this talk uh, is by way of sort of uh, a gentle background, sort of introducing notation and, and trying to uh, set the scene mainly. So let me start. The I'm going to fix a prime L throughout. And for convenience, I'm going to fix also an isomorphism between the complex numbers and the algebraic closure of the <coughs> L-adic numbers. And I'm going to, F will always be a number field. And let me start by uh, reminding you about the case of GL1. So in this case, we're going to study Grossen characters. Which are continuous homomorphisms from the IDL class group of F to the complex numbers. And on the other hand, we're going to study continuous l characters are, uh, say, mu from the Galois group of F into the multiplicative group of l numbers. And automorphy in this case is some sort of correspondence between these things. Uh, but one can't, in general, such a thing uh, doesn't exist. We need to restrict the class uh, of characters we're thinking about. We'll think about the algebraic Grossen characters. And we'll think about the algebraic, as I'll call them, uh, eladic characters. Uh, so on this side, what does algebraic mean? Well, it's something that depends only on chi infinity, which is the restriction of chi to the infinite it else. Um, in fact, uh, I only need to take the connected component of the identity here. And the requirement is that this uh, maps an idel x. Well, over the product, I have a number of field embeddings of f into c, which extend by continuity to homomorphisms from the completion of f at infinity to c. And I take tor of x, let me say, to the minus n tor for some integers. Enter. And that will be my, the, the, at infinity, on the connected component of the identity at infinity, it has this form, is what one means on this side by algebraic. On this side, we mean that for all, will be a condition just locally restricting to, so, oh, so GF is the absolute Gower group of F. Sorry, I should, maybe I should have said that. I just need to restrict to a decomposition group at uh, primes, above v, uh, primes above L. So on this side, we ask that for all primes V divide L, uh, mu uh, restricted to the decomposition group 
at V is what is called Durham. And I don't want to spend the whole lecture talking about what Durham means, but let me at least remind you that there is a topological ring called B Durham, a topological uh, FV or FV bar algebra, which is graded and uh, has a with a semilinear and uh, with a semilinear action of the Galois group. <coughs> and for any embedding tor of FV into my field of coefficients, which is the algebraic closure of QL we define Diderahm tor of, in this case, my character mu <coughs> to be, I take the tensor product of B Diderahm over Fv with respect to tor uh, with uh, my Gawa module, so QL bar with the action of mu in this case. This has a diagonal action of the, this Gawa group. Here it acts linearly, here it acts semilinearly. I can take the fixed points. What is left is a QL bar vector space. Sorry, filtered. With a filtration. Uh, <coughs> and it always, well, I could in this case, it has dimension 0 or 1, and the correct condition that it's Durham is simply saying it has dimension 1. I could do this for any QL var bar vector space with an action of GFV. And then you would get a QL bar vector space of dimension less than or equal to uh, the dimension of W, and the condition of being Durham will be that it's actually equal to. Yes. You said there is no correspondence if you go from point antibody to the both sides, but of course that's not true. If you take two, you could take a non antibody type pair of two mere type two, and uh, with with all these values, you get six antibody on both sides. No? Yes, but there's no Grossen character. I mean, there's certainly a continuous character of the L Del class group into. Yes. If, if you take homomorphisms from the Idel class group to QL bar cross. Uh, but, but continuous with respect to the elladic topology, whereas here we're continuous with respect to the complex topology. Uh, yeah, I should have said. I mean, if, gr if Grossen means every, anything, it means continuous. Sorry. The complex numbers are really the complex numbers. Yes. So this is an isomorphism of abstract fields. The topology on the two sides is totally different. Ah, <coughs> uh, sorry. What was I saying? So I, I told you what uh, this Dura means, and I wanted to point out that we get a set of integers associated to this, which is namely the the degrees in which the filtration here drop, jumps. So uh, one could define, one does define Hodge Tate tor of <coughs> W, it could be this, just this mu, in this case, to be the set of a multi set, a set of in all integers i, taking i has multiplicity, uh, the dimension of the ith graded part of D Durham tor W. 
So this will be a multiset. If in the Durham case, this will be a multiset of cardinality, the dimension of W. So in this case, it will just be the case of a character. It will just be one integer for each embedding uh, <coughs> uh, tor of uh, f into QL bar. Uh, OK, and now if I impose algebraic on both sides, there really is a bijection between these two things. Um, <clears throat> uh, to describe it, I should uh, just remind you of a <clears throat> few bits of notation. Uh, inside, if V doesn't divide infinity, inside the uh, decomposition group, the local Galois group, we have the V group, which is sitting in here in a dense way. It's not compatible with the topologies, which contains the inertia group and the topology on here is defined by making this with its usual topology open. And the quotient is then an infinite cyclic group generated by the Frobenius element. And I would take geometric Frobenius, so Frobenius alpha to the order of the residue field will be congruent to alpha on some maximal ideal. So geometric Frobeniuses. And then we have the local Artin map, which gives an isomorphism from <coughs> Fv cross, the multiplicative group of the field, to the abelianization of the V group. If V divides infinity, it's trivial that we have isomorphisms from Fv cross modulo connected component of the identity to the local Gawa group, which is, of course, a billion order one or two. And then we have the global Artin map, which is just the product of the local Artin maps, which will map now the Adels of F to the abelianized global Gawa group. And the kernel is except where it certainly contains f infinity cross 0, because that, those things were in the kernel here. And Artin's reciprocity law is that also the, the kernel is just within there is the closure of f cross. Uh, well, this was for v dividing infinity, so that's this is either trivial or one and complex conjugation. So, uh. <clears throat> not very serious. And then, of course, the way we get this bijection, this thing certainly factors through GF abelianized, which, by class field theory, are. Uh, just corresponds to characters uh, psi maps f cross over f cross f infinity cross 0 to uh, QL bar cross continuous. But more than uh, continuous, we still have to impose this algebraic or Durham condition. And as Sarah realized, that's the same as saying that psi restricted to uh, some open subgroup in the completion at L will map uh, x onto the product of tor x, uh, let me say to the minus m tor. Let me, we have these numbers. Let me say that 
the Hodge tape number of mu is uh, is m tor at tor, so minus m tor uh, for some open subgroup here. So this is now tor in hom f ql bar, and the map is simply sends uh, mu goes on to mu composed with the inverse of the Artin map. He composed with the Artin map. <coughs> and now these things can be compared because they can both be compared with the set of characters chi zero from AF cross, let me say, to C cross, uh, where we now say that chi naught has open kernel. So, that, so now the topology here is somehow disappearing, and uh, chi naught restricted to F cross maps uh, <coughs> X onto the product of tor in homomorphisms from F to C uh, onto tor of X uh, to the N tor, probably. And the, I mean, there are obvious maps here. I send a character chi onto the thing which sends x onto chi of x product uh, tor maps f into <coughs> c tor of x infinity to the n tor. That cancels out. This action at infinity, so it makes the kernel open at infinity, but no longer does it trivial on F cross, but it has this thing on F cross, and I do exactly the same thing here. I send a character psi onto the character that uh, sends x onto psi of x, which I better apply I inverse to, and then I have to take the product of tor in hom f. QL bar, I inverse tor of XL to the M tor. And this gives a bijection, and this is a bijection to everything. Uh, matches up. And one can check that in this various process, one really done nothing very much at the places not dividing L. So for all V not dividing L, <coughs> we are, are going to call this map in this direction RLI, so I may drop the I. Uh, RL of a character chi, if I restrict it to the decomposition or even the V group <coughs> at some prime V, not dividing L or infinity, then and I compose with the Artin map, this is nothing else than the component of chi at v, the restriction of chi f v cross. So at all primes not dividing L, there's a sort of obvious chorus. This pins down what the relationship had to be. And we also see that the Hodge Tate numbers of R L chi, well, that these m's have to equal the n's in this. So this will be the uh, <coughs> set containing n tor. So the Hodge Tate numbers are pinned down by what was happening to the Grossen character at infinity. OK, so now let me turn to GLN. Maybe I was <coughs> going to say that the 
algebraic Eladic characters are at least Zariski dense in the space of Eladic characters. So in some sense, if you know about what happens at the algebraic characters, then you might, by some, you might imagine continuity has told you something about all Eladic characters. On the other hand, on the side of Grossen characters, it's not, it's not true that uh, the algebraic ones are Zariski dense or something like that. There are really whole regions of Grossen characters which don't see anything algebraic. So it's only a very small part of the <coughs> world of Grossen characters that you're seeing in such a correspondence. OK, so <coughs> when I move to GLN, instead of Grossen characters, I'm going to talk about cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN of the Adels of F. And, <coughs> well, OK, let's talk about this for a moment. So these means, this means admissible representations of this group, uh, which occur in some space of functions. I mean, what, what happened to the invariants under F cross? Well, they have to occur in a space of functions which are invariant by GLN of F. And then there's some growth condition. <coughs> on here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we're just going to talk about n-dimensional continuous, uh, let me say also say irreducible representations of GL of the Gawa group representations from the Gawa group of F to GLN QL bar. This will be my analog <coughs> characters. And again, uh, one can't expect a correspondence in anything like this generality. So one got to put some condition on. And again, I'm going to call it algebraic. And again, on the side of automorphic, sort of analytic side, algebraic is going to mean something to do with the infinity part pi. Pi will be a restricted tensor product over all places of a re local representation. So pi infinity, which will be the representation of GLN F infinity, corresponding to this, will be an irreducible representation of this. Uh, and so the center of the universal enveloping algebra of the restriction of scalars from F to Q of GLN will act via scalars on here. So you'll get a character, the <coughs> center of the universal enveloping algebra. And Harish Chandra uh, parameterized uh, characters of this algebra. Uh, so what one wants to consider somehow a maximal torus. And in here, I want to uh, extend scalars to C or something. So T cross C, this cross C will sit in. which is just GLN over C, one copy for each homomorphism of F into C. And this, again, will split up as a product over Tor mapping F into C of some torus T Tor, which itself will be isomorphic to, uh, say, the diagonal torus N copies of GN. So the 
character group of this torus will be something like z to the n, one copy for each homomorphism of f into c. And the harris challenges parameterization uh, describes characters of the center of the universe in enveloping algebra in terms of points in the complexification of this modulo the vial group. So uh, if you get parameter Harris Chandra, let's say of pi infinity, which will be under this decomposition one for each tor, so the product over tor in hom FC Harris Chandra tor of pi infinity in uh, <coughs> uh, product over tor z to the n complexified uh, modulo the vial group, which in this case is the symmetric group on n letters. And algebraic will mean that this thing Uh, is integer or nearly integer, the convention I'm used to using is that either all the entries are integers or half integers depending on whether n is odd or even. Fits well when you think about the cohomology of Shimura varieties and things to use this convention, but you can Maybe easier, in fact, to state the final theorems without it. Okay, so that's what algebraic is going to mean on this side. On this side, algebraic will mean essentially what it did before. Well, this time I have to add that, uh, let's call this something R, that R is unramified at all but finitely many primes. That was automatic in the case of characters. It's not automatic here. And secondly, that uh, R is Dharam. <coughs> and so in particular for all Tor maps F into QL bar, I get the Hodge Tate numbers just as before, Hodge Tate tor of R, which is a multiset of n integers. And then <coughs> the Fontaine Maser conjecture says that these should be in natural bijection. And one should ask what uh, natural means. Uh, so one thing one should want, just as in the case of Grossin characters, the correspondence was very simple uh, at when I restricted to what was going on at primes other than <coughs> L. So in this case, for all v finite, oh, again, I'm going to call this thing, if it exists, RL or RLI. It really depends on I as well. If I take RL of pi, which will be a representation of GFV, restrict it to the uh, decomposition group a prime v, then to this one can associate <coughs> what we call 
of a Deline representation, I'll say a word about this in a minute, over QL bar, I apply, well, okay, on the other hand, if I take the local component of pi at v and I twist it by the absolute value of the determinant to the 1 minus n or n minus 1 to the 1 minus n over 2, uh, I should get the same thing. This is, <coughs> this is a it's the analog of the compatibility at finite places that we had in the previous case. So let me uh, say a quick word about what all these things mean. <coughs> so pi, as I say, is an automatically a restricted tensor product of local representations pi v. That's the pi v. Uh, this is the local Langlands correspondence. Uh, in the in what would be Langland's normalization of it, so for instance, the reciprocity map of a sigma dual, the reciprocity map of sigma dual, the reciprocity if n equals one, the reciprocity map of a character uh, equals the character sorry, composed with the Artin map is is the character. Uh, so there are a number of natural functoriality statements, all of which I'm not going to state, which characterize it completely. But it, ge it generalizes just being composition with the Artin map in the n equals 1 case. Uh, what sort of object is it? Well, it's a pair. Uh, so it's what's called a Vedelin representation. So it's a pair rho n, where rho is a in fact, oh, sorry, I should put Frobenius semi-simplification here. Rho is a, a, a semi-simple representation of the V group of Fv, and n is an endomorphism of that space, of the space on which the representation acts, which are linked by the property that rho sigma n, rho sigma inverse is, I think, the absolute value of the inverse Artin map of sigma uh, times n. So local Langlands correspondence gives you such an object. Similarly, on the Galois side, if I restrict the Galois representation to a decomposition group, I can construct such a thing. If v doesn't divide l, the construction is elementary. Uh, Vedeline, uh, I'm going to call it S, F, semi simple, <coughs> uh, should be what? It's uh, roughly speaking, I, semi, I restrict F to the Ve group and I semi simplify it, and I take N characterized by s um, somehow it's the uh, derivative of the action of the Tame inertia group or for sigma in some open subgroup of the inertia group at V, we would have S of sigma is exponential of T of sigma times N, where T is a chosen map from uh, inertia group of FV onto ZL up to ZL cross multiples as a unique such T. Uh, and it turns out that up to isomorphism, it doesn't matter which you choose here. Yeah, this is a bit slightly vague because really N is an endomorphism of the original space and the semi-simplification that isn't naturally uh, act on the original space. But anyway, you can, you can make sense of this. In the case V divides L, Sorry. But it might have. 
that's, I semi, when you semi-simplify, the infinite part of the image of inertia will go away. Well, V divides L, it's more complicated, and I, I, I don't want to describe it, but you can still attach exactly the same data to a Duran representation, not to a general representation, but to a Duran representation of the decomposition group at V. And the second uh, naturality statement uh, should be that these harris chandra parameters coming from pi infinity should match with the Hodge-Tate numbers, which are saying something about the... Uh, action of the decomposition group above L. So Harris Chandra tor of pi infinity should be the same as the Hodge Tate I composed with tor of uh, RL pi restricted to the uh, decomposition group by V. So V divides L is somehow the place determined by I composed with Tor. Okay. Well, in this generality, uh, very little is known. So, in order to sorry, let me just remind you, this says Harris Chandra tor of pi infinity is in n minus one over two. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, sorry, I, I wrote the wrong thing, didn't I? My apologies. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So this is minus Harris Chandra Tor of pi infinity plus n minus 1 over 2, n minus 1 over 2. So I take, I mean, this is an n tuple. Take minus everything and then shift by this. If I got, I think, let me check that. Minus plus n. Yeah, I think that's right. Sorry. So as a shift, there's also a minus sign that comes in for a reason I don't understand. Sorry, what are they? Well, they're what you think they are. They're the, they're the power. Uh, so chi infinity map x onto the product of tor of x to the n tor. Harris Chandra parameter tor of chi infinity is the, well, I put minus n tor. It's the set containing minus n tor. It's the, it's the exponent, but so the n tor would actually become the, Hodge Tate numbers, when I talked about characters, I put a minus here. Also, just before you erase that page, and what you call the function that you injected, I'd like to conjecture some function in it. So I've done almost all. But they did conjecture this, didn't they? Oh, well, <laughs> they conjectured this direction, I guess. And maybe yeah, Laurent yeah, characterized the image over here, or? And yes, <laughs> and Langland's name should certainly be there too. Uh, yes, I'm, yes. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's some idea that there was a correspondence here uh, is due to Langland's. And Laurent singled out what one should be looking at on this side, and Fontaine and Mazer made precise what one should be thinking out on this side. That's probably the fair way of describing the history. <coughs> Sorry. OK, well, to make any progress, as I say, we need more assumptions that I want to describe. So <coughs> firstly, 
I'm going to insist on regularity. A regular on this case just says that the Harris Chandra tor of pi infinity, well thought of as an element of the co-character group, is regular, uh, meaning it's not orthogonal to any co-root. Or concretely, just meaning you have n different integers, or half integers. For each tour. Maybe can you just clear up the minus on the, on the side of the joint transforming? For in the Abelian case, what does it say? Uh, does that depend on the choices of the uh, isomorphism of the normalization here? But uh, you could certainly always invert the normalization, but if, if you want. Yeah, so I mean, I think maybe one other thing I should have said. I mean, first of all, uh, I'm normalizing, oh, I didn't even say that. I'm normalizing the Artin map so that it takes uniformizers to geometric Frobenius elements. So that, I, yeah, I mean, you could invert that, I guess. And fr frob is always the geometric one. And the second thing you need to know is how you're normalizing Hodge-Tate numbers. And I'm, I'm going to say the Hodge-Tate number of the cyclotomic character is the set containing minus 1, because <coughs> it's in H minus. Uh, somehow every other convention here is cohomological, so I want this to be cohomological too. So I want cyclotomic character. And that, yeah, sorry. I, should. I think in the, in the mystery, there is a mystery. It, it's just that when you write down the L function, uh, if you write down the L function for the, uh, in a classical sense, then the uniformizer has, yeah, if it's the uniformizer has uh, absolute value of one over the uniformizer. So that's the uh, <laughs> <laughs> In my experience is you can chase these things around endlessly, but, uh, <laughs> but I hope this is a consistent set of uh, assumptions. And here, uh, <coughs> well, you know what it has to be now. Regular uh, means that the Hodge-Tate numbers tor of R has n distinct elements. Elements for all tor. And I, I say you need this. There is a little bit of work when you relax this, some, some type with maybe with multiplicity two of elements of these sets. There's the work of Deline Serre for GL2. Uh, there's some work of myself for GSP4. There's the work of Wuxi Goldring for some unitary groups. So there are some partial results when you allow, you relax this to make, to allow multiplicity too, but they're quite few and far between. And uh, when you allow higher multiplicities, nothing is known. So it does seem a very serious restriction. For instance, when you relax this, as relax it beyond maybe this multiplicity too, seeing these automorphic forms in any way that's remotely algebraic seems beyond us. I mean, that's went to Carrier's lectures and Griffith's lectures and so on. They were all devoted to trying to find a way to see these things when you, when you, not regular or quite not regular, but hasn't succeeded. <coughs> And the second condition that one needs to do very much is some sort of 
self-duality condition that I've been told I should call polarizable, though maybe uh, odd polarizable or something might be better. So what does this condition mean? First of all, we're going to restrict the base. So F should be CM or totally real. And I will write F plus for the maximal totally real subfield. So in one case, F would equal F plus. <clears throat> uh, and it actually uh, is con going to be convenient not to think of just pi, but to think of a pair, pi psi. So pi will be regular algebraic cuspidal automorphic. And psi will be a Grossen character, which actually will be automatically, when I write down the next condition, uh, algebraic. And it has to satisfy that pi composed with complex conjugation acting on the Adels of f uh, should be isomorphic to pi dual tensor, I think just get this right, uh, psi, oh, a Grossen character of what uh, over the maximal totally real subfield should be psi composed with the base change, composed with norm over as the determinant. So pi, pi conjugate dual agrees with pi up to a twist by a character. And I want to insist that the character actually that comes from the maximal totally real subfield <coughs> and I also want to insist that psi v of minus 1 if I restrict v to an infinite place I can evaluate it at minus 1 I want this to be independent of v dividing infinity So sorry, I, I put the character in because it's conceivable there's more than one character which has this property. And somehow I'm going to want to keep track of which one one has consistently on the two sides. So it's easier just to have it as part of the notation. This condition, I believe, should be redundant. I mean, I believe whenever this happens for, for a regular algebraic pi, this thing should be independent of v divides infinity. But I don't know how to pr prove that. A remark I mean, it strikes me as a remarkably simple statement about automorphic forms that I don't know how to prove. Uh, it's true if it is redundant if f equals f plus and n is odd or, or n equals 2. Uh, this, the n odd case is very easy. You'd get the nth power of the the nth <coughs> power of psi is the square of the central character of pi, and so this thing actually has to be one <coughs> because it, an odd power of it is is the square of something of order two. So it's, odd power has to be one. So it has to be one. This case is already a slightly subtle argument. Uh, no, I don't, I, that's a good question whether that really is redundant. OK, so that's uh, <coughs> it's what polarizable means on the side of the automorphic representations. On the side of <coughs> the Galois representations, well, again, I better look at pairs, R mu. So R maps GF. To G L N Q L bar uh, <coughs> continuous uh, algebraic regular irreducible and mu again will be a character of the Gawa group of the maximal totally real subfield continuous necessarily 
algebraic, one from what comes next. And again, I better assume mu C V, a complex conjugation, is independent of V dividing infinity. And such that uh, given a complex conjugation in this Galois group, there exists a pairing, which I'll decorate with the choice of complex conjugation because it would depend on it, QL bar to the n cross QL bar to the n to QL bar, a non-degenerate symmetric pairing <coughs> such that uh, if I look at R of sigma x, R of c sigma c, the conjugate of sigma by c of y, that is the same as mu of sigma times uh, x, y, c. So this condition appears to depend on the choice of complex conjugation. It doesn't. Uh, if you have this for one c, you automatically get it for any other c. So if true for one c, and that's an elementary argument, true for all c. It's an elementary argument based on this assumption that the sine of mu is really constant. Um, <coughs> And I should remark that in the case that f is really an imaginary field, f is not equal to f plus, psi is not, is only, I can always twist psi by the uh, character, the quadratic character that cuts out f over f plus, so I can always assume the sign is fixed. So in both cases, without loss of generality, mu of cv e if f is not equal to f plus, then we can just twist psi, psi or mu so that mu of cv is minus 1 to the n, I think, is the choice I wanted. Uh, psi uh, just for convenience. So it's C here, yeah, this is a sigma. How do you draw a sigma? And I did want to remark of another way of about thinking of these, this polarizability on the Galois side. Uh, so if F equals f plus and mu of c is 1, then this polarizability is equivalent to the fact that r factors through. So going into GLN QL bar, it will actually factor through the orthogonal similitude group QL bar. And with multiplier, I'll write new for the multiplier character. Uh, the multiplier character should just be mu. And similarly, in the case f equals f plus mu of c <coughs> is minus 1, that just corresponds to r factoring through a map to the symplectic group. So n had better be even. Again, with the multiplier being mu. So you can see why I really want to say this polarizability includes some oddness condition. It's saying that the multiplier when you have a symmetric pairing is even, and the multiplier when you have an orthogonal pairing is odd. So it, it, it includes this sort of parity information. 
And in the case f not f plus, uh, it corresponds to r extending to a map of g of the totally real subfield into a certain disconnected group that I'm going to call <coughs> gn. So <coughs> let me just quickly define gn. gn is gln cross gl1 semi-direct product 1 and an element of order 2. And the action of j on here is that j of g lambda j inverse is lambda transpose g inverse lambda. <coughs> and this comes again with a multiplier character to gm, which sends a g lambda just onto lambda and sends j, I think, onto minus 1. Uh, yep. And so the condition here is that this should extend to a map like this uh, with multiplier, uh, sorry, if I compose with the multiplier map, I just get mu uh, with this convention on which mu I chose, and somehow r restricted to gf should be, well, let me say r tilde is r comma mu got to be going to go into the connected component. GF is going to go into the connected component of this disconnected group, and there it's just going to be R, the pair R mu. And it's often useful to think of these uh, self-dual, conjugate self-dual up to twist representations as rather being representations into one of these groups, simple, orth orthogonal similitude, symplectic similitude, or this disconnected group GM. <coughs> okay, and now. Yes, this is, I mean, in the, in the case f equals to f plus, mu is completely pinned down by this relation. In the case that it's not, there are two possibilities. And the, reason, the only reason for doing that is that then this diagram commutes. If I put a minus 1 here, uh, I don't really know how to, how to say it in the best possible way. Um, <coughs> okay, so let me finish. with uh, sort of half the theorem, which says how at least we can go in this direction from the automorphic forms. I think so. Suppose pi psi is a polarizable, which includes regular algebraic cuspidal self-dual, the way I sell things conjugate, essentially conjugate self-dual, the way I set things up, representation of GLN of AF, F being totally real or CM. Then, well, first of all, pi V is tempered. Pi is locally tempered, almost or tempered up to twist almost everywhere. <coughs> or everywhere, sorry, I mean. And secondly, there exists a unique semi stable, sorry, what am I saying? Semi simple, I mean, should be irreducible, but we don't know that in general. Semi simple, continuous, algebraic representation R L pi from G F to G L N Q L bar such that, well, first of all, it is really polarizable in this sense. R L pi R L psi is polarizable. C 
Secondly, we have <coughs> the Hodge Tate numbers of R L pi can be calculated in the way we were expecting. They will be the Harishandra parameters of I inverse tor, if I got this right, pi infinity minus plus n minus 1 over 2, n minus 1 over 2. <coughs> and if V does not divide L, then Vedaline RL pi is equal to GFV, being a semi simplified, is the reciprocity map applied to pi V mod det 1 minus n over 2. Uh, <clears throat> that's if V divides L and pi V uh, unramified. That's also true. And I believe we're very close to, to knowing it in general. Uh, so maybe, certainly if we don't worry about the, the, the n, the unipotent part of the action of uh, <coughs> the unipotent part, the, or the nilpotent part, uh, it's true in, in being written. Uh, then we're very close. I mean, hopefully, within a year or so, that should be tidied up. <coughs> uh, what am I doing? I've run out of time. Um, so that would uh, pretty much uh, uh, tie things up. The the <coughs> one can ask what's happening at infinity. And it turns out that in these two cases, polarizability tells you what happens to complex conjugation. There's only one possible conjugacy class for complex conjugation in these two cases. In this case, as Frank Caligari stressed, this information doesn't uh, characterize complex or conjugacy class of complex conjugation. So one could still ask what it is. And at least if n is odd, f equals f plus r. Uh, mu c equals 1, which is the ambiguous case, then we know that the trace of R L pi of complex conjugation has absolute value 1. <coughs> and that, that, inter that characterizes, again, the complex conjugation as being the thing that has the most minus ones in the adjoint representation. If n is even, uh, in general, uh, as far as I know, we don't at present know. I mean, then it sh same should be true with zero here, and that should again characterize complex conjugation as the thing with the most minus ones, but we don't know that at the moment. Um, <coughs> the, this theorem was proved by a, a lot of people over a lot of years. Made a list, Kotowitz, Clozel, Harris, myself, Belay, Chenevier, the best Shin Karayani. <coughs> the maybe I did. Want to say that just that there are <coughs> there are sort of three cases in the analysis. If n is odd, one finds the desired representation in a Shimura variety corresponding to a unitary group with this character at infinity, if n is even, one can't in, <coughs> one has to sort of go up one dimension. One finds it, this is what you might call an endoscopic form in the cohomology of a <coughs> unitary of the Shimura variety of a unitary group with this signature at infinity, as long as a uh, pi or Harris Chandra tor pi is <coughs> uh, what uh, satisfies a certain regularity condition. It was probably Michael who first 
suggested one use endoscopic forms here to find them. Well, for any acids, yeah. <coughs> and then in the uh, remaining cases, uh, you use uh, congruences. So you don't actually find a motif in the remaining cases. <coughs> so even for a Hilbert modular form, general Hilbert modular form of parallel weight 2, we still don't always have the motive. Sometimes you can only find the Gower representation by using <coughs> congruence arguments. So I apologize. I've gone on too long, so I'll stop here. And I guess, when do you want to start with David? He's gone. <laughs> Ran away. Uh, why don't we start again at 20 pasts, say? <coughs>